influenced by Thomas Massaric, Edward Bernays followed Bernays to Switzerland during the First World War. Finally established in France, though, Bernice with Masurk and Milan Stefanik formed a propaganda organization. In 1918, this organization would also become the provisional government of Czechoslovakia. After the fall of Austria-Hungary that year, a new government was formed and Bernice was appointed as foreign minister. He would remain in that position until 1935, where he headed a delegate to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Benice also championed the League of Nations all throughout the interwar period. As council chairman of the League of Nations six times, Benice opposed the unification of Austria and Germany. He deemed it a threat to the survival of Czechoslovakia's existence. Benice nego negotiated defense treaties with Romania and Yugoslavia, which were aimed at preventing Hungary and German dominance re in the region. During the 1920s, these three nations sought economic and political cooperation, negotiating an alliance with France in 1924. This alliance thereafter became a bloc against Germany and the Soviet Union to, to a lesser degree. Let me point out the fact that this is b before World War II, just after World War I. You have Benice negotiating with three different countries creating a block against Austria and Germany. Benice was also the chairman for the League of Nations, not once, but multiple times. He uh, served as council chairman of the League of Nations six times. I'm not saying that Germany and Austria were in the right I'm not saying that they were in the wrong. I'm not saying either way. All I'm saying is that there was basically a barricade being set around Germany and to Russia, like, the, like it says, to a certain degree. Now see, according to socialism during that time period in that area, they appalled pan-Slavic ideologies. They also op op opposed pan-Russian ideologies as well. Their goal was to basically eradicate it and to get rid of it because it didn't serve a purpose for, or for their job. They started creating a block to isolate them because they considered them like an infectious spot that needed to be picked off. Just horrible, horrible ways of thinking. If you take and you look at the things that are happening today in the comments that I had mentioned, what they thought about Russia and what they thought about Germany, and then you apply that to the way people today are talking about Russia, China, you know, the Middle East and Muslim, radical Islamic ideology, you, you start to get an idea that, that these people's minds are being molded to where they're thinking that way, and it's escalates. And humans have a bad tendency of repeating the past if they don't learn from the mistakes they make. For me personally, I believe that we haven't learned the mistakes that we made. Not only have we not learned it, we weren't taught it. We weren't taught that these things were happening before World War II. We weren't taught that because the people who 
would have told us that story were the people who lost the war. We weren't told that even though Bloom believed in equality and the 40 hour work week, utopian and non violent beliefs, he felt it was necessary to send France's military into Germany and cause forced labor on the German people in order for them to pay back war reparations. I believe that that was very important information. It gives you an idea of what was actually taking place back then. For us to believe that this country just out of nowhere decided they were going to try to take over the world and their crazy psychotic leader was the only person behind the whole devious plot to rule the world. I, I believe that, that is probably the dumbest thing that, that we could possibly think, you know, but we've been taught that. We've been taught that everything that happened in World War II lays right directly on the lap of Adolf Hitler. When even Winston Churchill said himself that it didn't matter who the leader was, if it was Adolf Hitler or anybody else, we would have went to war with Germany. And that right there says it just as clear as possible. It didn't matter who was in charge we would have went to war. In 1932, Engelbert Dalkant became Chancellor of Austria, eventually destroying the Austrian Republic. He then replaced it with an authoritarian regime based on Italian fascism and Rome Catholic principles. He was a member of the Christian Social Party the core of whose members were from Austria's conservative peasantry. In 1930, Dolphus served as president of the Federal Railways. In 1931, he served as Minister of Agriculture. By 1932, Engelbert was chancellor heading a conservative coalition led by the Christian Social Party. Because of severe economic crisis brought on by the Great Depression, Engelbert Dolphus decided against unification with Germany. He was partly dissolved because of a $9 million loan given by the League of Nations. He feared that countermeasures by the Allies might be taken against his country. Unification with Germany was advocated by many Austrians, resulting in severe criticism from Social Democrats, Pan-German Nationalists, and Austrian Nazis. He then countered by drifting towards a more authoritarian regime. <clears throat> Benito Mussolini became Engelbert Dolphus's closest ally. In 1933, Italy guaranteed Austria's independence at Roussillon. In return, Austria had to abolish all political parties and reform its constitution according to the fascist model. Dolphus attacked Parliament within the same year abolishing legislation and replacing it with a corporate state. In 1934, parliamentary formations loyal to the Chancellor crushed Austria's Social Democrats in bloody encounters. In that same year, with a new constitution, his regime became to totally dictatorial. It was nothing more than an Italian satellite state, but in June the Germans incited the Austrian Nazis into civil war. 
Dollfuss was assassinated by the Nazis on the raid of the Chancellery. In 1935, however, Edward Benes signed a mutual assistance pact between Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. In that same year, Masaryk resigned as president and Edward Benes was elected into office. Adolf Hitler gained power in Germany in 1933. The alliance that Benes negotiated, <clears throat> Little Intente, created a permanent secretariat and council afterwards, consisting of foreign ministers that met three times a year to direct common policy. Edward Benes substantially granted the student land Germans the right to autonomously self-govern themselves in 1938. Nevertheless, Bernays was unable to avert the end of the Czechoslovakian state, which was abandoned by its allies that same year. Soon Germany annexed the sudden Sudeten land of Czechoslovakia. After Romania, Yugoslavia, and France refused to send full military assistance. Soon, Edward Bernays submitted to the German ultimatum and resigned as president, retreating into exile during the Second World War. He ended up in France, establishing a Czechoslovakian National Committee, which moved to London in 1940.